prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you, O Lord, again feasting upon your words of life which you have set for your people, that we may learn from the beginning what you have spoken. O Lord, that we would not be an unwise people, a people that are unguided, that are not led in wisdom of your Holy Spirit. O Lord, you have given us that promised Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit, and you continue to remind us of the truths that have been spoken long ago, even the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us understand them through what you have given in the beginning to Moses here in Genesis. And teach us, Lord, as we go over these subject matters for the next couple of weeks, Lord, on the subject of the woman, the wife, and the husband, the family, the marriage, we ask, Lord, that you would teach us and that we would be humbled before you as we receive these words. O Lord, teach us, sanctify us. For your name's sake, glorify yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this evening we return to our study of the book of Genesis, and we are in chapter 2, verse 18. And really, we will later on bring verse 22 and 23 as uh, it speaks of the formation of the woman. We had previously noted how the book of Genesis establishes a godly mandate for the man. How Adam was given lordship over earth to subdue it and to work and keep it according to Genesis 2. Uh, now, and now in Genesis uh, 2.18... God provides for us the structural role for the woman, especially in the marriage relationship, in the context of the marriage relationship. And let me say first that the woman was not created uh, to be above the man, uh, to rule over him or to exercise an authority over him in any context. No matter how intelligent she may be or how wise she may be, how hardworking she may be, even how beautiful she may be, she was never created to be above man. And this biblical truth about her goes up against anything that modern feminists has to say. And the text tells us that it is not good that man should be alone. God made the woman to be a helper fit for him. It establishes that the woman was made for the man, and as for the purposes of God, she was meant for the man and meant for the purposes of God. Now, this is not to say that the woman has no value apart her relationship from man or with man. But it does mean that God gave the woman a fundamental role in the marriage relationship to fulfill. And if not in marriage, then in her submission to her father, to her mother, to her pastor, to her earthly employer, any context where she finds herself under the leadership of a man. When being asked of young men of who, which woman uh, should we look for? How do we know that a woman is godly and she's ready for marriage? Well, how does she conduct herself according to the scripture? Look to the word of God and see, does she submit to her husband, or sorry, to her father? How does she submit to her mother? How does she submit to her earthly employer? How does she submit to her pastor? All of those things matter. And if she is ready, and, and you'll know based upon how excellent she works, how excellent she honors her father in humility to her father. The woman's very creation in verse 21 to 22 displays that her role is of a humble position. First thing to note down, she was not made existing on her own will. And this is a very humbling teaching for my sisters in Christ. We are called to live in Christ in such humility already. But to understand that from the beginning it was so that your role as a woman is a humble role. Your creation here in Genesis 2, 21 to 22, already speak and display of how humbling this position is. First, you were not made existing on your own will. Second, God had already made a man who was given earthly authority, who came before her to rule and subdue the earth and to work and keep it. Third, 
God could have made her the way he did with Adam. But instead, to relay the importance of her humble position and role, God formed her from Adam's rib. She was made for the man, hence she is made from the man. Does that make sense? She is made for the man, hence she is made from the man. And that will go, and that should go with her for the rest of her life. She is from Adam. Of course, from God, but from Adam. And fourth, God brought her to the man. After she was formed from his rib, God brought her to the man, a helper suitable and fit for him. You see, to be a man under the authority of God is already a humbling position. But to be a woman under God and to be under a man that God has given her is a very humbling position. And I say that to, bring pers or to put pers into perspective that very role as a woman. Therefore, it's important, my sisters, to understand this humble position according to God's design at creation and the damages that the fall bring upon that position and how we should view that position in our redeemed state. And that will, I believe, if we hear and obey, and by the Lord's mercy, will sanctify us. Let's begin first in understanding this position at creation. Verse 18 says that God will make a helper fit for man or fit for him. The term helper in today's world is looked down upon. It is a menial, low status, without skilled position. Even the term assistant seems like of no value. The idea usually stems from self-absorbed, self-centered, high-ranked people of society who look down upon those below. And you're going to be, I pray, that you would be amazed at the very use of, of the Hebrew word helper here in verse 18. Because scripture denies uh, any thought of, that the modern world says about a helper. The scripture and its definition of a helper, or at least the intention of the word helper and its usage here, is not the way that we would view it today. Our Lord himself rebuked the disciples and warned them that they should not be hungry for power, desiring to lord over others. He says that those who are truly great among you are those who make themselves servants, just as he did when he came to save. Mark 10, 43, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And so we should not look upon the helper role as a role of no value. It is one already from the beginning, according to Mark 10, one that reflects the very Savior himself. Furthermore, the term helper, the Hebrew word ezer, when used in Scripture, always denotes strength and ability. Never weakness and never inability. Genesis 2.18, that usage of the word helper, refers to somebody who is able Somebody who is of strength. That word is so special that aside from its usage describing the woman, most of, its, most of the time that it's used in the Old Testament, it is used to describe God. Ezer. It's the same term that is used in Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Exodus, uh, Exodus 18.4, the God of my father was my help. And 1 Samuel 7 verse 12, till now the Lord has helped us. Now this is not to say that the woman is God. She is not God. But the term is fitting because of her God-given strengths and distinctives. And her God-given strengths reflect God, who is our mighty helper, which is of great encouragement to our sisters in the Lord. To any woman made in the image and likeness of God, to all women made in the image and likeness of God, when understanding their role, and especially in, uh, in a redeemed state, her help, her ability, her support to her husband 
is a reflection of the God of Psalm 121, Exodus chapter 18 and 1 Samuel 7. You are a reflection of the mighty helper, our God. The term can also be seen in a military context. Most of the times, actually, it's used even in that uh, to describe an ally who is along one side in battle through hardships and joys, working together for the same cause. And really, the woman was made to go alongside her husband through all the hardships and difficulties and all her joy and all his joys, her joys. They are working together for the same cause. Her helping then is not just any help. You see, she is not just to help randomly as she desires or chooses. But the word of God says there in verse 18, a helper fit for him. It is a fitting help, a suitable help for man. A helper fit for him in the Hebrew, kenegdo, literally meaning opposite from him. Help that is opposite. Now, what does that mean? Well, well all, it has to, all it means is that she is that perfect and fitting counterpart that matches with Adam, that matching counterpart, as though she was shaped as that puzzle that fit in that place that missed a piece. She's not identical to the man, but she is complementary. She is fit for him. And she, and the help she gives, is what Adam lacked. Men, uh, this is also very humbling. The fact that the Lord had created a woman shows you that you do not have it all. That you are not perfect. That even there, you are created with a lack that God will fill, not in yourself, but, a, but in someone else. The fact that those of you who are married are given wives show that you are a weak man. And without her, you are lacking, greatly lacking. And so she and her help alone is what man lacks, what Adam lacked. And God made her in such a way that she was the only one that could meet every need in the context of companionship. So unique is her role that another man cannot provide such companionship. And I say that because of our day that forces same-sex marriages. What about another man? What about a best friend? What about a friend? No, there is nothing that can replace that wife that God has given a man. She is unique, and not even a lesser creature of the land, the sea, and the sky could substitute in, and, and replace her. She is so special that without her, the man is unable to grow to the fullness of his manhood, to the maturity of manhood, and fulfill his task given at creation. It is not to say that those who are single and not called to marriage are great, gr greatly weaker, but is to say that the fullness of man's creation or design is understood and realized in the context of marriage. And so without her, Adam would not be able to grow in that manhood or that mature manhood that God had designed for him. And neither is he able to fulfill the very tasks that God gave him at creation, which are, so, which are essential to, to the very promise and blessing of God of the multiplication of many image bearers. It is without doubt then that her role at creation was to serve as an able helper who reflected her creator by her every contribution to the man's life. Feeding him, planting seed with him, preparing what he needs to fulfill his earthly duties, loving him, caring for him, having fellowship with him, and by childbearing, which is essential to the human race. She in every way displays the love of God for men in being, again, as I've said earlier, a mighty help to him and serves as a reminder to the man to live his humble role before God. If you may turn with me, please, to the book of Proverbs, and I'd like you to turn to the 31st chapter of Proverbs. And we're going to read from verses 10 to 31. 
and see how the Scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit, would give to us the portrait of a virtuous woman. And it almost seems that anybody or any woman who reads this, even any man who reads this and tries to look for a virtuous woman, it almost seems impossible to find somebody like this. Uh, the very mother of King Lemuel said it. It's hard. It's hard. However, I believe that this in itself is a portrait of that God-given design of that woman from the beginning. How is she to be that suitable, fitting helper for him? And I'd like to again bring to your attention that out of the faithful mother's concern for her son against the seduction of evil women, of harlots, prostitutes, this is why chapter 31 verses 10 to 31 were written. It was not just to advise him to find a virtuous woman, but it was to warn him not to be married to a woman who will put him in danger. So really, as I said, this is a great picture of what the woman ought to be according to God's design. Verse 10, please, let us read and we will break it down together. An excellent wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes beds, or she makes bed coverings. For herself, her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Amen. Verse 11 speaks of this woman's fidelity and her oneness of heart, which make her the heart of her husband to safely trust in her. She is a faithful woman, a trustworthy woman, a woman that not only will support him in the physical things, but will support him, of course, with the things of greater value internally, which is to trust her, especially in the context of a sinful world. His heart trusts safely in her, in verse 12, his burdens are relieved and his mind is exempted from teasing irritations or vexations that may come upon the mind because she seeks him and does him good and not harm all the days of her life. In other words, God's design for the woman at creation was not so that she would become a weight or a burden for the man and not and keeping him, sorry, from fulfilling the very duties that he had been assigned at creation. She was never meant to be the stumbling block, nor the hurdle, or the hindrance to his way. But she was designed to excellently enabled by God to do him good. Again, the term helper, at that state without sin. She is able she is mighty by the help of God, and she is designed to do him nothing but good. He has no need to worry about her. He has no concerns about her, no thoughts of worry, for she does excellently for his good. 
And I believe 1 Corinthians 13 will help us even understand what it means to live out that seeking his good in love, of course. He is at ease in his absence from home, knowing that he has left the house safe in her keeping, knowing that when he returns, he will be welcomed with gladdening smiles, that the house is, in a, is managed by her, that it is taken care, cared of. She knows how to conduct herself, and when he returns, it is not all destroyed. He does not have to labor beyond what he has already labored in the sense that she has taken care of the things that she could handle. In verses 13 to 27, that great portion, she is a wise and useful wife. She is a wise and useful wife, and this is what you ought to pray to the Lord for, my sisters in Christ. She is not engaged in self-indulgent inactivity. She is not a lazy woman. She is not every day on the couch, not every day sleeping for hours and hours in idleness, doing nothing, and just stands up when it's ready uh, or it's time to eat. Later on, it says that she will not eat bread from idleness. She will not accept that on her table, and she will, even if it was placed on her table, she could not swallow it knowing that it was not from hard labor. She is not lazy. She is not inactive. Matter of fact, she, brings in, uh, she seeks and brings those materials that she needs outside and gathers them and brings them home for the needs of the home. That she may labor at home. It tells us that her needle is always at the service of her family. She is always there. She does not murmur but works at home willingly with her hands, everything she touches. The mop, the dustpan, those clothes that come out of the dryer, everything. Changing the baby's diapers, stirring the baby's milk, rocking the baby to sleep, everything. She does it with joy. Matter of fact, it continues on. It says she exchanges her work. That very unique work she does at home, she exchanges it at the market for food that her children and her husband can eat. She thinks of her, or sorry, she thinks of the interest of her husband all the time. As the scripture says that she carefully considers the fields before she purchases them. She observes whether this field is going to be good and beneficial for her family. And when she does purchase it, she plants with her own hands produce for her family. She ensures their safety. She makes their clothing. When the snow comes, she laughs at it because they're ready. And listen, her clothing are not the clothing of the pagans, of jewelry, fine gold, great dresses. The writer of this section of the Proverbs says that strength and dignity are her clothing. The clothing of her inner man. And that's really that perfect portrait of the woman made in the image of God according to God's design at creation. She is a woman of strength and dignity. And the mind of the writer is pointing us back to the design at creation. A helper suitable for him. This entire section cries out Genesis 2.18. Her inner man is clothed with strength and dignity. Not weakness and indignity. Not shame. And every time she speaks, she is a woman of wisdom of edification to her husband and her children. Not speaking of vain things, of things that do not matter, of things that will not be her husband's strength, nor her children's strength, of things that will only lift him and not discourage him. Her mouth is of wisdom. And because of this, she is looked highly upon at home. In verse 28 to 31, 
Her children testify of her godliness. Because it is her priority to seek, aside from the happiness of God, the happiness of her husband and the happiness of her children. The great commentator of the book, a book of Proverbs, Charles Bridges, once said, aside from pleasing God and the happiness of God, he writes of the woman, to live for her husband is her highest happiness. How many of you wives could say that today? To live for your husband is your highest happiness. Well, honestly, it doesn't matter what you say because it is God's design at creation for you to fill that role. That is God's ordained will for you to live, to seek the happiness of your husband, not in sin, but in holiness, as we are discussing the state prior to the fall. To live for him is her highest happiness. Do you thank the Lord that he has given you a husband, waking, beside, waking up beside him each day, a husband who will labor and provide, a husband who will lead you into the direction of Christ in the worship of God, who, like Adam in the garden pre, before the fall, who was that ruler, who was that priest, prophet, and king of the Garden of Eden, and do you seek to glorify your God by doing that which is good for your husband. For the children, their mother is constantly before their eyes. They always remember her tender guidance from their young age to when they grow. They remember her wise counsel, her loving discipline, and holy example. Those, of, those mothers here today who have young children, you ought to pray to the Lord that he would grant you the strength to live in this way, that as your children grow, that they may grow in the fear of the Lord and they may recall that wisdom, that tender guidance, that loving discipline, and that when they grow up, they would remember. You dare not uh, set them aside now, that when they get older, they have nothing to remember of your motherhood. Pray that you may live out this holy example. And they never cease to call her blessed, according to what is written there in verse 28. And the same is for her husband. He says nothing less of her. He is attached to her on the grounds not of deceitful beauty and charms, or charm. He is attached to her because she is one who fears the Lord, according to verse 30. And so husbands, if your wives in the redeemed state, saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, are those not concerned of how they look like, who are not concerned of the external things, but cons are concerned of the inner man, of the glory of God, then you ought to love her and thank the Lord for her. Because this is the woman according to God's design. She is not just one known for the skill of her hands, but she is one that does all things in reverence to God. Amen? Amen. And this is really a great picture, a portrait of her. However, when we get to Genesis 3, and we'll get there at some point in verse 16 of Genesis 3, there are great damages to that role which takes Proverbs 31, and as you look at it as a woman, as a man reads it in his desire for a virtuous woman, the fall brings tension to the mind, the difficulty of how to live, a woman, how, of how she is able to live this way, and how a man is able to find one who lives this way. The woman was made to support her husband, as we have understood but at the fall, being tempted of the serpent, she has become the temp or she became the tempter. And the ruin of her husband instead of the support of her husband. 
You see, the fall is always a reminder that without the restorative and redeeming gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, man can never excellently live up to his design as an image bearer of God, whether male or female. The fall reminds us, in this context, as we are speaking of today, in the role of the woman, she is unable to live excellently according to that God-given design unless she had been restored and redeemed by the gift of grace in Christ Jesus. She may try to live excellently, unbelieving, but she will still fail. And this is... Uh, Great to consider since if the woman had first fallen or the woman since the woman first fallen, she has a greater bend to become her husband's tempter and ruin. She leans more to become his ruin than one who supports him. I remind you, it is because of fallen woman that Proverbs 31 was written. Otherwise, the mother wouldn't have had to warn her son if all the women were virtuous. The woman became stained since her fall. And according to scripture, the various scripture passages that speak of women and their great fall. In scripture, she is often described as one of immorality. Living as the tempter, as the prostitute, as the harlot. She is the one who gives herself away for men to use her. She is often described as a self-absorbed woman who focuses on external things, her physical glory, concerned about her beauty, the compliments of others. She has become an insecure woman, a gossiper according to the New Testament. A tale bearer, one who is quarrelsome. And in all of those things that scripture speaks, uh, when the scripture speaks of the woman, these are all burdens to a man. Today, you'll hear even fallen men say that it is better not to be married, for to be married to a woman is heartbreak or bank break. How fallen man has become to call that which God has made in his image and likeness a burden. But the fall makes it so. Because of the greatness of her sin in Genesis 3, she is now repaid with great curse. And what is that great curse? She will now bear children without ease, always in pain. She will not be able to have pleasure without pain. She will not be able to enjoy the bearing of children without pain. But the most terrifying curse given to this woman is that instead of having a desire compatible to her husband's, her desire will naturally, because of the fallen nature, will be against his. Not compatible. And so when those describe, you know, there are men and women who describe trying to find a partner that is compatible with them. Though we understand what they're really saying, but it's, it's false. You will never find somebody that is absolutely compatible with you. Unless really God would bend the hearts for such a great unity. But even those who are married and have found that they were the ones to be together forever, even in their marriage, the nature of the woman in the flesh always is in contrast to the desire of her husband. Oftentimes, this is the cause of the, for divorce. The argument, the, the conflict within the home, the division of opinions... The woman does not stay in her humble position as God had made her in Genesis 2.18. She seeks to grow in power and become his equal in the sense of authority. She will not allow him 
to rule the home. She will not allow him to decide. She will not allow him to lead her. Her desire will naturally be against his. And so she becomes the burden to the man instead of that consistent and blessed support to him. Proverbs 21.9 This is often laughed at, but it is, it's nothing to laugh about. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. You see? Why? Because the men of those days complained. Actually, a lot of them complained to Moses in the five books of the law. They complained to Moses, my wife, I want to get rid of her. Doesn't brush her hair. She doesn't groom herself. She, she has let herself go. Some complain because she's a chatterbox. She doesn't stop talking and she does not stop causing fights. And so Proverbs 21.9, it's much better for a man to live in the roof or on the roof than to live in a house with a quarrelsome wife. In the New Testament, again aside from her gossiping and tail-bearing, she is even a distraction in church to her husband and to the people of God. Because she talks all the time during the message or when the preacher is proclaiming the word of God. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35. The woman should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission. As the law also says, if there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. This is of no disrespect to the woman in church. This is not to say that the moment the sermon is over, you cannot talk. But the, peop the women in Paul's days were so out of order that when the preacher was giving the word of God, they would be asking their husbands, talking to their husbands, distracting their husbands, and their husbands cannot get what the man has to say. Hence, he cannot go home and teach his wife what he just learned at church because she's distracting him. She's always asking questions. And so it's not wrong to have questions, but Paul says, put it in order. Go home and ask him there. If there's a comment, ask or tell him there. Uh, not during when God is speaking through his word. He goes as far to say that it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Again, it is a sign of our, your submission to your husbands, to Christ. And so the Bible, do not be mistaken, values the woman created in God's image and likeness. However, the fall also teaches us that the role of the woman has been greatly stained. And if we are not guided by the truth of God's word, and if we are not made born again in Christ, you will live exactly what has been described, the burden, the burden to men. And it will be to you, my sisters, because without the Lord Jesus Christ's guidance and without His Word, without the mind of Christ, without the power of the Holy Spirit's transformative work upon the hearts, you will be this way. You will be this way when you do not learn to mortify your flesh. You will be this way when you do not learn to submit your contrary desires to the truth of God's word. I warn you of the greatness of sin and the damage you can bring to yourself, to your husband, and to your children. And even to the church. So recognize the damages and threats to the role of the woman. You know, for some great time, there was a point in the church life that uh, there were married individuals that sought for counseling. And the common problem in these marriages is that the woman would not submit to the husband. She has her own desires, have her own ambitions. She will not allow the man, because of the man's weakness, she wants to take the wheel and direct her family. 
And so Peter says something about this in the New Testament. In the case where the husband is weak and the woman, the wife is the one who, of course, is blessed of God to understand the truth. <clears throat> she is to live her life in godliness and even in silence that in her life she may win him, but never to dethrone him or overthrow him. She must maintain that order in her family as one who submits under the leadership of that man who God created to subdue, to work, and keep the earth. She must maintain that role as one who supports him, who is able, and who is of strength, that he may be, again, obedient to God. And so it is... In, in, when you consider a marriage and you consider God's will for the man, if the man is excellent in his obedience to God and able to fulfill his duties according to God's design, we also must look at the woman and the blessedness of this woman, that she would be hardworking, supportive of her husband, that she may allow him to be obedient to God according to his word. But if the man is unable to live his tasks, aside from his own weaknesses, we are also to look at his wife. If she has become a stumbling block to him, a hindrance to him, a hurdle, and a, um, one who prevents him from committing himself to the work of the Lord. I warn you, my sisters, I warn you, women who are here today, of the damage that you can bring because of sin. Sin destroys. And if you think that your beauty will keep you safe, it will not. So young women here in, in this place as well, do not focus on those things that will make you beautiful. The one who is to be praised according to verse 30, and that is not a godly praise in the sense of worship, but of great commendation, at her excellence, is one who fears the Lord. You should look at the mirror and that's it. Not visualize yourself as one who is Miss Universe or the one who will win every pageant like Esther. Contentment. Fear the Lord. Watch yourselves lest you become those harlots of Scripture. Furthermore, you go on your social media apps, you go onto Instagram, and you see what the woman is to the world today. Do not become like that. Do not become like that. Her strength, her clothing, sorry, are strength and dignity. Remember. Beware, because as Adam fell, you will cause a million men to fall. And even in the context of that sacred marriage, you will cause your husband to fall if you do not watch and mortify, if you do not have the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Well, what about as Christians in our redeemed state? Now, I'm telling you that uh, this is not it. We will go through the, the woman and the man in the context of marriage, in the next couple of weeks, we will go on to the role of the wife, the role of the husband, the role of the family. Because we will get to the portion of Genesis 2, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. How does marriage look, uh, what is marriage according to scripture, according to God's design? But for now, we will continue in this study of the woman, and how should we view her in our redeemed state? Well, as just said, without Christ, to live excellently as a woman according to God's design is impossible. But in Christ, there is a recovering of that God-given design. We were not just restored to Christ and reconciled to God, but we have been restored and enabled to live according to God's design as His female image bearers. Why? Because according to Ezekiel 36, he creates a new heart from stone to flesh. 
and He gives you His Holy Spirit and writes upon your hearts His holy statutes. He makes you new, makes one born again. And a woman that has been redeemed in Christ Jesus has been changed in her heart. And the fall's curse, or the curse of the fall, is put to an end. As the Lord now resides in the heart of every believer, in the context of the woman, He resides in the woman made in the image and likeness of God. And what she was unable to do, what she failed to do, with the help and the grace and the mercy of the Lord, she will be willing and made able to support her husband. And as the Lord changes the heart, He allows you to see the greatness of your sins and how fallen you have become because of sin, allowing you to see your great need of the Savior, Savior allowing you to see the need to repent and believe in Him, just like the Samaritan woman of the New Testament or the woman with the issue of blood. Mary and Martha, Lydia and Phoebe. There are great examples of women in Scripture redeemed in the Lord Jesus Christ who follow Christ and have set for us a great and godly example. By the Holy Spirit of God, He has placed now those godly desires in her heart. Desires of obedience, desires of worship, desires of order and of godly purpose. Desires nothing but the good for her husband. And now, in her redeemed state, her excellence to this complementary role is not anchored on Adam. But her excellence to support her husband is now anchored in Christ Jesus. How wonderful. Amen. When Eve was brought to the scene, all she had was Adam. Well, definitely God. Her love for God was there, certainly. But does that not put into great perspective the blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ as He came and He conquered death, hell, and the grave, imputing His righteousness unto you. And now your obedience to live and support your husband is anchored out of your love and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. The woman is not perfect when she is made born again, but she is enabled by the Holy Spirit's power. The woman has great weaknesses, but the Lord is a merciful Lord. And He teaches her. He leads her. He supplies her the strength as, that as she submits to Him, she will be able to submit to her own husband. She will be able to excellently live in that way. And I hear it all the time. Wives say, Pastor, well, how am I supposed to submit to my husband if he does not practice proper authority? He doesn't have order in authority. Well, pray. Talk to me about it after the service. We can talk about that. But never, never go out of line. In your submission to Christ, submit to your own husbands. That is our calling in Christ. That is your calling, sisters, in the Lord. I, I, I hope you understand how blessed you are in Christ to have been restored to Him. And to have been restored to what he intended in Genesis 2.18. And so I advise you and instruct you to live your lives not in the pride of this life, not in the immodesty and the trends of this world where women are without respect, self-control, and are only focused on gain and beauty, which are all vain. According to the word of God, I pray that you would conduct yourselves as those who live quietly with all submissiveness. As Paul speaks of in 1 Timothy chapter 2. To live in the way which is proper. That's what he instructs the woman. Proper according to what? Well, proper according to one who professes godliness. That's what he says in 1 Timothy 2, 10 to 11. 
He says it is proper for a woman to conduct herself in all submissiveness, in quietness, and with all good works. What are the good works? Well, we've just described and discussed in Proverbs 31. With all good works, as it is proper for one who has been redeemed. I advise you to work at home. According to Paul, Titus chapter 2 verse 5, work at home. Elderly women, teach these younger women to work at home. She cannot be a blessing outside the home. And, when, and what grieves me the most is when people use Proverbs 31 to justify her absence from the home. When the whole entire section given to speak of the woman, and when she does leave the home, it's only because she's gathering materials for the home. It's not to say that she shouldn't leave the house or she can't exit the door. But she is not, according to the Word of God in Genesis and Proverbs 31, is not telling us that she should consume and assume the role of her husband as the primary provider, as the one who is what we would call breadwinner, Pastor, that doesn't seem so fitting with our modern day. Of course it isn't. Because the feminist, the ungodly feminist, is there a godly feminist? No, there isn't. And I call them ungodly because feminism in itself disrespects the values of Scripture. It distorts what God has designed. And feminism, as it arised in our nation, or rose in our nation, it indoctrinated women to become equal with men in society, in politics, in employment, in marriage. This is why we are left with what we have today because of disobedience to God's design at creation. So see to it, my sisters in Christ, to work hard at home. Do not see it as a curse. That is a blessing. A blessing. And for you elderly women, as also, I've also heard before, well, pastor, these are only applicable to those who have children, and uh, our children are grown up now, so we can do whatever we want. No, you cannot. Paul advises elderly women to be reverent in their behavior. Because he warns them, lest you become a stumbling block to them. And a poor example for them to follow. You are to always teach that which is good, encouraging the young woman to love their husbands and children according to God's given design. Oh, we are blessed in this church, aren't we? We have been blessed. For all these years, I've been praying to the Lord that we would be given a mix of people of different age. And it's important in the life of the church that we may learn and grow in wisdom of those who have gone and stepped ahead of us, that we may learn from them and their example in Christ. Well, to end, 1 Timothy 2.15 says that the woman will be saved by her living out of her godly role, childbearing, it says there. But that's not to be mistaken that the way to salvation is if she gives birth. But that's with regards to her living as a woman who fears the Lord according to God's design. But Paul says there that she will be saved by living out her role in faith, in love, in holiness, and self-control. And so pray to the Lord, my sisters, faith. Faith, not your faith. Faith that is given from God, anchored on the truth. Love. You want to know how to love? Read 1 Corinthians 13, that entire chapter, which is so convicting. And I believe it will teach you in how to love your husbands. 
Then look to Ephesians 5.22 and see the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and how you ought to submit to Him. And in the same way, in an earthly sense, you are to live that way in, unto your husbands. Holiness. Do not touch the unclean thing. Do not stain yourselves any further. Read Romans 6 and understand that when Paul was saying, shall we continue in sin? God forbid. No. How could we, who are in Christ, live any longer therein? You are to set an example as godly women, as those who's, who've been redeemed. You are not to fit in with the world. You are to be those called out of the world, holy. Not just to shine as light into the world, but to your own children, to your own husbands. And self-control. Eve lost her self-control and became the ruin of her husband. And the self-control of women in Scripture, gone. But in Christ... He enables you to live a disciplined life. When to speak, when to suggest, when to rebuke, when to practice discipline, how to approach your husbands in humility. Who is fit for such things? Only by the grace of God. And my sisters, He is merciful to help you. And we pray that the Lord will continue to guide us as we move along each week, starting, well, moving along each week as we speak of the subject of the wife, the husband, the family, the children. In Genesis, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, I pray that this would allow us to grow in Christ and that we would all have families anchored in Him, blessed in Him, as we are reconciled to him, that we may sing and praise him for what he has done in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness toward us, Lord, that you have blessed us with that understanding of the woman created in your image and likeness to help the man. She is not to be looked down upon according to what your word says. She is unique. She is special she is of one one of ability one of strength but you remind her today lord that the fall has caused her to fall away so far from this design unless she thinks of herself highly she must now look to you you who is the better adam who has imputed upon her righteousness and we ask, of Lord, that you would empower our wives, you would empower our women, you would help them live godly lives, faith, li lives of faith, lives of love, holiness, and self-control, to learn how to conduct themselves, again, not out of legal obedience, but out of loving obedience to you, who died and rose again for them. And if there are any women in this place, O Lord, who have not been made born again and have not been given a new heart, we pray for their salvation as well. Lest they continue in the direction of the curse and fall into the hands of a just God and be punished one day on the day of judgment. Teach each woman, teach each man to love their wives that we may care for them and point them to the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. Use these words, O Lord, for the glory of your name, we pray. Amen.